there. Come on. For some reason, uh, I'm getting a little stalling uh, from page to page there. But hey, we are here. It's the new year. It's the first one of the new year. Maybe uh, my eCam program is just a little. It's still kind of in 2023. <laughs> Anyway, how you doing, everybody? Dave Fenoy here. Welcome to 2024. Let's keep our fingers crossed that it turns out to be a good year. I uh, want to remind you that uh, all these Ask Dave Fenoy Anythings live on my YouTube channel, Dave Fenoy VoiceOver Training. Right down there at the bottom of the page, you see subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dave Fenoy VoiceOver Training. Please do. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me about uh, taking some voiceover coaching, uh, DaveFenoy.com. Just click on the Study VO tab. And by the way, I have instituted a points plan. So when you uh, purchase some coaching from me, or if I'm doing a workshop, that uh, you you will be able to add points that you can use later to uh, get other Dave Fenoy services. Um, now. Let's get going. I, I have a wonderful guest. He is one of the most talented people uh, in this business in the area he works in. And of course, like most of us, he has some talents uh, that maybe you don't know about. And we'll mention those. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it is <laughs> Mr. Johnny Heller. <laughs> hey, Johnny, how you doing, man? The applause is cool. <laughs> I, I was I not that prepared. Would make smile. <laughs> Ooh. So, uh, how's the weather in New York? It's um, it's wet right now. We, uh, we didn't get the snow blizzard everybody predicted because we rarely do. But it's uh, it's about I don't know, forty five and uh, moist. Yeah, I I, I, I saw it. There moisture. were crazy winds, lots of rain. Uh, did you get caught in it or being a voiceover guy with the studio at home, you haven't been out of the house in days? No, I'm out. Of, I go out of the house. I'm, I walk through Central Park almost all the time or I take walks all the time. Uh, ah. so I'm out in, I'm out in all the weather. I'm a Chicago boy originally. So, oh yeah. So you, I'm, I'm not, I'm not affected by this stuff. Oh yeah. Oh, this city of the big shoulders. This, yeah, this butcher is, this to the world. Not... The yeah, windy that's, city. That's right. I began, of course, as a butcher to the world. He <laughs> started as a butcher. <laughs> well, of course, that's the Chicago story. So, yeah. uh, welcome in. It's good to see you. You know, uh, I mentioned when we were talking previously that one of the best things about doing this is uh, my voiceover buddies, uh, who I get to see at conventions and whatnot, and we broke bread and downed a few and had some uh, laughs and said some things we wouldn't want to say uh, out loud in public. But uh, I get to know you in a way that I don't know you otherwise. I can kind of know your reputation. We kind of hang out and have a good time. But we're going to find out some things about Johnny Heller today that we just didn't know. Speaking of which, how'd you get in this wacky business? Um, I will tell you if you answer a question first. Sure. Is is there? There's a bizarre little delay between. It's like watching a Japanese movie um, with a bad dubbing. Is there supposed to be a little delay when I speak? And then. No, there's not. Oh, okay. uh, what well, I there's... just what I just noticed when I hit start, uh -huh. there was a delay on the start. And it's weird. Then... I feel like I'm in a Woody Allen film. Yeah. Okay. It's... Well. <laughs> it's okay. I, I mean, I hope nobody else story. is going through it, but uh, <laughs> I'll repeat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did, you, you see, did you ever see what's up tiger little the woody allen movie oh uh, yes early. yeah yeah, yeah. oh i'm ah, sorry oh my, my knee we we can't mention woody allen anymore he he's all oh, right yeah yeah it's woody still, allen bill cosby still funny. yeah you know what bad whatever you think funny is funny yeah that's all i've got to say you know uh and this is so off topic but so many of our favorite artists are not necessarily people that we'd like to hang out with or believe with believe what they believe or certainly don't approve of things that they've done. Picasso um, was a wife beater, for God's sakes. Yeah, yeah. Does that mean that this piece of work he did? I'll tell you, before I get into my, I did a book. 
uh, mm-hmm. uh, 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 the education of Little Tree, wonderful coming of age story. The guy who wrote it, uh, Forrest, I forgot his name. He, Trump. no, <laughs> Rod Forrest. He, he was this, he, let's, I can't, somebody will remember his name. Anyway, it's a great, it's a charming, wonderful, beautiful book. It's like just wonderful and very moving. But the guy who wrote it was a racist KKK member who left um, um, George Wallace's campaign because he thought Wallace was too soft on blacks. This, <laughs> this, so that's who this guy was. However, the book shows none of that. And then it comes to the bigger question, do we reject art because of the politics or fascism or hateful personality of the artist? If Jeffrey Dahmer had done the Mona Lisa, would it still be a great painting? Wow. Wow. Deep, deep stuff. It would probably cost more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it it's weird stuff but I, I think these are the things that keep me up at night yeah, oh, yeah but here, here, here's how i started um in chicago i had uh, um i was in i i, I was a poli sci history major that's what i am and um i got into i, I wanted to, i left a newspaper reporter's job in chicago the uh, chicago sun times to pursue my love of acting and I did stand-up comedy and stuff. And I was in an acting workshop with a guy named Ted Liss. He was my teacher. He was my guru, this three-year program. And it was wonderful. And at, those th- at that time, the commercial world was dominated by white men with deep voices. That voice of God era, you know. You know La right. Machine by Mullinex. That was that guy. Yeah. Well, he, he brought some agents in who liked the, the, the quirky sound. of my, I'm quirky at best. So they liked my quirky sound. And I started doing commercials. I didn't even know about it. So I started doing commercials, and then, I, then of course, my first job was theater. I got my um, equity card first, and my SAG after. Then uh, I was doing theater, stand. I was doing theater, stand-up comedy, and voiceovers. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, and then, of course, I also had a like a twenty-five-year career as a bartender. So to keep the acting bug alive, um, <laughs> but yeah, so but uh, yeah, but I initially started off pretty well. I started off with acting jobs, and then had to get into restaurant work uh, when the show closed or things like that. Um, but that's how I started in audiobooks. I they obviously I didn't know about them until I, I came to New York. I think I came to New York in eighty six or so ninety ninety one. Richard Ferone, the late great Richard Ferone, um, was a dear friend of mine. And he said, "Hey, you know, you have a youthful. You're he was pretty diplomatic. About you have it. a what? He said I have a pretty youthful voice. And what he what he wanted to say was they needed at recorded books." They needed a, a, an adult to be a sophomore, hyperactive child in books. And so <laughs> it was a natural fit. So I went there and that's how I started. I started uh, doing uh, audiobooks there. And I, le- I learned with some of the greats, uh, George Goodall, Simon uh, Preble, uh, Barbara Rosenblatt, and they all welcomed me into their, into their world. And to be honest, I didn't even know, I didn't know much about it. Um, I didn't know there were other companies doing it. I thought it was another like side gig on my way to being um, second banana in somebody's in some movie or something. That was my plan all the time. Too little to be the leading man and too cute to be the evil guy. So I thought I'd be the second banana or my dream has always been to be the um, a dead Irish priest at the beginning of a law and order episode <laughs> lying in a pool of my own blood. That's <laughs> It hasn't worked out yet. Yeah, so that's still a, that's still on my bucket list. You're making my wife back there. Laugh. <laughs> I see. You. I've you met know. your wife. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, it might not be too late to uh, play no, that role. No, no, and, and there are no lines. You don't. You don't have to. Yeah, work yeah, out. yeah. That, yeah, I can't remember lines anymore. So just lying in a pool of my own blood would be perfect. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. I'm been infamous for having said I've done three books three audio books, and I hope to never do a fourth. How do you do it? I don't have the vocal stamina uh, or the attention span um, to go hour after hour after hour after hour. Say you got a 350-page book. How long does it take you to do it? Uh, 350, be it would come out to about 10 to 12 hours okay. of, of recorded time. Uh-huh. And... And the way that it works is it's generally the industry average is two to one. So a 10 hour book will take 20 hours just to narrate. 
And that's not including the prep or the mastering, editing, and the retakes after it's and, done. And what's the prep? The, reading the book and looking up the words and making sure you know what you're talking about. So you read the whole book first? Yes. Oh. It's I, I, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, you, can't, you can't tell a story if you don't know the story. People ask that all the time. It's odd. It's like, you have to read the book first. No, you, why don't you just tell me the beginning of a joke and I'll figure out the punchline. You know, of course, yeah. Oh, you no, two you guys know, walking. Um, I would think perhaps you could go chapter by chapter. I read this chapter, now I record this chapter. Well, or okay. I read this paragraph and now I record this paragraph. Let's say our hero of my book is Dave Fenoy. And I don't know much about him, but I'm chapter three. In chapter four, I find out Dave is Jamaican. Jamaican man. And I haven't played, and I've been playing him as a, a Czechoslovakian uh, a, a cattle driver. Um, so, um, so you know, in other words, you you need to know what's happening. To tell a story, you need to know the story. Yeah, you know, so you, and see, my my brain. Uh, th well, you would think that the publisher would give you notes on the book. No. The character is no, this. The, was the... No, the publisher gives you the book. See, this is why uh, I've and, only done three, and will probably never do a fourth. Well, I, I'm a voracious reader. I read. I, I've always been a big reader. A fast, not not a big reader. I read a lot. I'm not really that big. I'm a short reader. Um, uh, but I, I I read a lot, a lot. So it's part of my and most. And I'm fortunate enough in this stage of my career that most of the work I get is stuff I would be happy to read anyway. Ah. Um. So, for example, I'm doing a, I'm doing the Blues Brothers for Dreamscape right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, a book I would definitely read anyway. I'm, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a stand-up comedy background, Chicago background, Second City background, yada yada. Um, uh, and then oh, following up, I'm, I'm, I'm that was huh? Sad. Oh yeah, yeah. Yada, yada, and yada. and, and, and with the close talker guy. And then, um, <laughs> and, and and then on um, the book after that is a Western history book, American West, something else. I'm so. All my interests. You know, I I saw that. Uh, you did a book on the herbs. On oh Tuesday. yeah, the, yeah. Tom Tom Clavin. Um, 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 what's it called? It's called OK Corral. No, it's called. Tombstone. I have to look it up. Tombstone. What a yeah, fantastic. And they turned well, it into I, a movie. Oh, well, I think I think <laughs> it had maybe been made a number of times before. Clavin, but oh, it's yeah. a really book. It's all about the, and that's that's kind of stuff. I. People don't know that, that they think Johnny Heller, you know, and they don't realize that I love American history. You know, my library, my personal library is stocked with presidential histories and biographies mm. and war and war history. I'm fascinated by all that stuff. I, okay. But the book I'm reading that I got for Christmas, um, Christmas last year, is a giant volume of English history, British history. And that's what I read in my spare time. Oh, boy. And Yeah, so I, I like things like that. Do you have a lot of spare time? I do not. Okay, but I, yeah. So it's going to take you a while to read that book. Yeah, it's going to take me forever. I, and also, it's so thick and so interesting. I have to put it aside, and I have to go back to the beginning all the time because I can't. You, you can't pick it up like you're in the middle of an episode of Fargo. You have to, you know, you have to go back to the beginning. Yeah. Um, well, let, let, I forgot. Let's, let, now, you, you you told me how you started. You didn't really. Yeah, I just kind of fell into this thing. Well, I didn't follow it. I always wanted to. I I was always wanted to be an actor. Always, always, always. No, no. Dream. But as audiobooks, I'm talking audio. Oh, audio audiobooks. Audiobooks just kind of happened for me, and it became my niche. It became where I belonged. It's everything. It checks all the boxes except for the immediacy of audience approval and validation. You know that. I mean that that's as a stand-up comic that was so so important to, to what I was doing and why I wanted to do it. And also in stage, I mean, the, the immediate approval, the applause, all that stuff is, um, yeah, it, it, it's, 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 oh, it's like, it's, it's just so invigorating and wonderful. And, and it validates everything you do in audiobooks. I read it all. I have no idea if I'm doing a, if it's funny, when do I pause? When are they going to laugh? Should I pause for a laugh? What if the laugh isn't there? Wow, well, that's interesting. Space. That's uh, kind of reminds me of being a morning jock on radio, where I told jokes that um, there was nothing on the line for me in terms of I could imagine people in their cars on their way to work uh, laughing. Uh, hopefully, yeah. they did. Some people told me, you know, days later, weeks later, whatever, that they did. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it, I didn't have that immediacy of. I, these people are right in front of me, and some of them shaking their head and going, "What the hell? Uh, why aren't they laughing?" So I, I, I understand yeah, yeah. that.
Um, so this checked off some boxes. It's interesting because I also had a performance background as a child and always wanted to be a performer. So, uh, and I found out when I stopped being a musician uh, professionally that all I really wanted to do was perform. Yeah. And don't tell anybody, but if money weren't a thing, we'd be doing this for free. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, I would. Um, and- I wouldn't read. I wouldn't read all the crap I read. I'd, I'd be more selective. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to say, what's the worst book you ever read that the whole time your inner dialogue is going, "What the hell am I doing reading this book?" But you probably don't want to say, do you? No, I do not want to say because the author may get better. You know, a lot yeah. of uh, a lot of people have. Um, uh, access to uh, word processing software. Um, and so they put out books and some, some of them don't have a story in them. Um, and some do, but you know, it's not my job. My job is the audiobook narrator as an actor is to tell the story and not editorialize, not judge it. But yeah, some books are much worse than others. And, and, uh, and some books just aren't good, but, yeah, true. but some author, let's say, um, let's say, I mean, J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. One of his next book is just just a piece of crap. Well, he still did Catcher in the Rye. Or if his first book's a piece of crap, but in him somewhere is Catcher in the Rye. So I I, I, I think it, it's harsh for me to judge. It's like judging an actor. when If someone comes to you, coaching-wise, wants help, and you just don't see it, you want to steer them toward things they might be better at. But then again, they may one day be the next voice you know i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you honestly i've had some students that when they came to me i did not think they were going to get it at all and then some of them have and i've had some students yeah. that I, I i think had all the talent in the world um but not the discipline uh to actually mold themselves into what is marketable uh people with a tremendous voice, but they refuse to learn to act. Well, David, well said. Oh my God, so many people. So how many people have we dealt with said, people tell me I have a nice voice. And, you know, I think, well, you know, A, you don't, and B, who cares? It's yeah. not, it's not, the, it's not the nice voice. Can you act? Will you act? And there are a lot of people want what Dave Fenoy has without realizing the sacrifices you made, the struggles you went through, the dedication, the perseverance that made Dave Fenoy the success story he is. You didn't just show up and be great. Oh, no, I did. I really did. I was. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. But everybody else. Yeah. I mean, there, well, there's talent and everything, but the things you had to do, you know, I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I had a uh, just all the crap. I think of all the jobs I did in the furtherance of my career but it meant the world it not it, i think people who can who have an acting bug to call it a, uh, for that and can get over the bug and go ahead and sell you know door-to-door kidney dialysis machines or something um yeah, they should do that if, if you can find another way that answers whatever's in your soul then do it because this is really hard it's oh, yeah. not for the meat it's not for it's, the it's, not, it's, it's, it, it's all work yeah. anything that you're going to find success at you're going to have to work at and there are going to be some ups and downs. Um, yeah. I, I saw a thing when I was investigating you. Uh, <laughs> five questions. And I, I thought I'd do my own little version of that. Uh, I like the first question that that uh, interview Jim Cooper. asked. Um, what do you wish you knew before you got started in audiobooks? Well, that's tough. I'm going to say now, I don't know if that was my answer then, but I wish I had known there were more publishers. I wish I'd investigated the, the genre, the, 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 the whole audiobook world prior to locking in where I did. I could have done a lot more. My career trajectory would have been a little different. Um, I also wish I knew this would have been <laughs> the high point of my career <laughs> and I never would have got the law and order gig that I want. Um, <laughs> but I, I guess I, 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 I wish I, I, I wish I'd also known that I could have asked for more money earlier. Mm. Yeah. It took me a long time to have the balls to negotiate up. Yeah, I, and 
you know, what are you know what are the ranges? I, I I know there's some people here who are interested in doing audiobooks, some who are doing audiobooks. Um, what's the what are the ranges? What's the lowest range, and what what are the ranges that guys in your rare air uh, can command? Well, it's 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 so different over the years because it used to be you got paid by studio hours, a totally different world. You get paid by the finished hour now. Yeah. Which means a 10 hour book, if you spend 30 hours to do it, you're still getting 10 hours. That's what you're getting. The SAG after has negotiated with almost every publisher and almost every publisher has SAG after rates. I don't know what the lowest number is, but they all pay pension and welfare. No, I don't. No, I don't. I, I think it's, it's either. Gosh, I th- it may be 190 or something like that, which is very low. Most rates, let's say you do ACX or something, you want to get $250 if you're doing your own, if you get it, if you're paying for the mastering and editing and things. 250 is, you know, a, a, a reasonable rate to start out at. Some people work for less, some people work for 150. It really depends on what you're comfortable with. But whatever you say is your rate, <laughs> that's your rate. That's what your worth is. So you yeah. need to think it through. In terms of working, I mean, I, I'm, I'm 300 and up generally. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, it, that's, that's, I don't want to give you the numbers, but it's like that. No, However, yeah. if, if, if someone, I'll, here's, here's a little lesson. If someone says to me, it's not just getting Johnny Heller or Scott Brick or, or some of that in a book. It's what's the budget they have for this given book. Not every book makes money. A lot of publishers put out a lot of books for a lot of different reasons. Like Blues Brothers is going to make money. They're, they're going to make money on that book. Well-known writers are going to make money. Yeah, well-known writers are topics that are hot. You know, if I write a book about about the pen, well, you know, it's not going to make a lot of money just to people who really are pen enthusiasts. If I write a book, the pen used by lesbian zombie nuns, that's going to make some money. So that's going to be a different thing, a different thing. So it depends what the story is. But you see what the budget is, and they say, Johnny, we can't give you your money. We can give you this much. My, my tack is, I'll tell you what, how much budget room do we have? Okay, I'll do it for this much as long as you agree that you give me two books after this at my number. Oh, there you go. There you go. So things like that. There's ways to turn. Got to be a little uh, bit of a businessman. I got to be a lot of a businessman. Yeah. This People forget, and, and this, this this is a business. It's not, you're not, it's the days of, hey, kids, I've got a barn. Let's put on a show are over. You know, the, you're, you're going to. They were and, over and, then. Yeah, they were, but we wouldn't have plays like Enter Laughing if we uh, acted on that. Yeah. Uh, what's your? Uh, how long have you had to have uh, your own studio? Uh, did you start out going to other studios, and at what point did you put your own studio together? And tell me about your studio. When I began and recorded books in the early '90s, we went to uh, that, that time they were in Chelsea. Then they went down to Union Square. And then I started working for publishers in their studios. I never went. I never had a studio. I never had needed one. When I started working with Tantor back in, oh, I lose track. I've been around too long. Uh, early 2000s or something. They want, They had their own proprietary software. So you needed their equipment. You needed a studio. And I didn't have one. Nor was I, nor am I, I'm sort of a tech Luddite. So I had um, some Soji screens and some blankets here in my apartment. And I'd have to take breaks. You could hear garbage cans and dogs and things. So that was not working. So I eventually, I think, oh, well over 10 years now, I got this whisper booth. Um, A whisper room, yeah. Whisper room, yeah. So it's fine. It's great. And what happened was I had all this. Let me see if I can take this off for a second. Here, here, I'll take a little tour if I can. Let's see here. See, I'm not good at this. Look at this. Okay, here's, wait, this blows. It was easier before. Screw that. I'm not going to do what I just did. I'm just messing everything up. See, now I'm off camera. Hang on. Okay, so look, here's it's so it's like a TARDIS, except it's as small inside as it is outside. So it doesn't <laughs> open, and I can't time travel. And I had all this foam stuff, you know, uh-huh. um, all over, and I was beginning to cough and hack, and I realized I need to get rid of that. I was I got hired by Apple News to do – well, I didn't get hired right away. I got not hired. They said, we love you, but your sound isn't up to snuff. I'm thinking, what? I'm doing all these audiobooks. So I said, well, let, I said, don't. They had an audition for me. And I said, don't, don't write me off. Let, I'm going to fix my booth. So my friend Bill Lord um, gave me these acoustic oh, yeah, I know tile that. guys. And he, and he told me how to put them up. And I'm such an ass. I even measured the room wrong. I ended up with two extra 
of these of these things because I thought my room was bigger and I measured it and I was wrong. You know, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> cut, measure cut twice, twice cut yeah. once. <laughs> I'm like, cut a million times, never measure. So, so I, I I set the thing up. It's all so now the sound was much better. It's much better, much more comfortable now. I have a little fan going. It's a much more livable space. Yeah. What, so what's your microphone? Yeah. Oh, you have to look and see. You don't know off the top of your head. Audio Technica. Um, 2040? 40, 4047. Oh, 4047. Okay. Decent mic. And uh, what's your interface? Scarlet, you mean? The Scarlet interface? Yeah. The Scarlet interface? <laughs> you yeah. really are a technical one. Right? <laughs> no, I don't know anything. No, I don't know. People tell me what. I had, uh, you know, Zane Birdwell and some other people. They came over and kind of set it up, and I haven't touched anything. Um Don Barnes uh, hooked me up. I did Pro Tools for a long time, and then Don switched me to Studio One. But I, I don't know stuff. If something if something goes wrong, I'm at a complete. I have to have someone come over. I don't know what I'm doing. And I what, do have other. And mics. You know what, uh, Johnny? I'm glad you said that because a lot of people who are getting in this business or been in it for a while now uh, have been intimidated by the idea of having a studio. And I. Uh, you know, some of us know more. I probably knew a little bit more than a lot of people because I came out of radio and I had to run a board when I was on the radio. Um, but a lot of people, no experience with it. But it's kind of like oh. you buy a car, you put the key in, or nowadays you push the button, you use the steering wheel, you step on the accelerator, and then the brake. Uh, you know, you, you know how to maneuver the car. You don't have to know how to fix it or build it. Uh, I'm not even that good. Great, right? but what's that? <laughs> I'm not even that good. The last time I rented a, I'm in New York City. I don't have. <laughs> oh a yeah, car. Your, your choices, your choices. <laughs> you get an apartment or you get a car. You can't do both. Oh so, um, boy. So I, I rented a car. This is a little aside. I rent a car. I get in and I'm in there. And Joanna and I are in there like 20 minutes. And we're waiting. So the guy goes, "Goes, sir, is everything okay?" I said, "How do you make this thing go? Because there's no <laughs> key." I said, I didn't know. He goes, you have to hit the, you have to hit the brake first. I said, why would you hit the brake first? And how is that intuitive? Why would you hit the brake to go oh, to boy. make it start? So it was, it was, so I, I, it, so that's, that's where I am. You but are very once it's, New York. That's yeah, once very, it's all set very up, New York. Yeah. Once it's all set up, then I just, I hit, I do what I do. And I've had, um, like when you start an audio book, so if you're, if you're a one person shop, you've got to do all the editing and mastering. I think I outsource that. First off, publishers do it for you. Mm -hmm. But if you're working, let's say David Fenoy writes a book and wants me to narrate it, I will ask David Fenoy to pay a Mrs. Fenoy editing to pay her the, the the fee to master it. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. I have no idea. And why should why why would you assume we already have to sing and dance and 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 tap and and act? Why do I also have to be an editor and a master? Those are special those are specialties. You know, what, I think uh, because I've only done three. Um, did you I, edit them? I did. I did. That's why uh, you hate that's, it. That's part of the reason why I don't want to do a fourth. Yeah, because uh, instead of two to one, it's six to one. Well, uh, let, me, let me ask you, that. What's, what's your day like? Uh, you've got a book you've got to get done. How many hours are you in the booth? Um, okay, first, Joanna and I share the booth, so it depends who's got work. We have a little board outside, and I I get up pretty early. Um, Define. And she doesn't. She, well, I don't want to, but I go to bed around one or two, and I tend to wake up around six oh, for boy. no reason at all. And, but then I grab naps. Um, I I just I don't seem to sleep. I don't know. So I get up and I do stuff. But when I'm in the booth, I give myself. I write down. I write down in my book ten to four record. But I know that I'm going to go out for lunch. Um, every hour I, I leave for like 10 minutes every hour just to wander out and shake it loose and, you know, keep my body from, um, just becoming like Yoda the hut. And, uh, um, and so, so, so you gotta move. So I, I would say when I, when I'm home, I, I'm, I work pretty fast. I don't make a lot of mistakes. So I do it. So I, I can work three, four hours, not right through. I take my breaks, but if I'm at a studio, if I go to McMillan, if I go to Penguin Random House, John Marshall Media, something, I go there. You're there ten to five or ten to four thirty, whatever it is, and you're you're working right through. I kind of like that because it keeps your uh, your nose to the grindstone, but you but you're you're actually performing five six hours straight. 
Do you find that when uh, you have somebody there um, that you're working with in somebody else's studio, is your focus better? Do you get distracted when you're working on your own? No, I really get, I don't get distracted by anything. If I hear my dogs barking or, or, or someone shooting at me, I'd probably notice it. But um, if it in it, my home studio, no, if I'm, I, 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 part of what makes a really good audiobook narrator, an important part is absolute attention to and, uh, uh, and, and being always into the moment of the script. If when you're working, you start thinking about, you know, tuna melts or something, and that's not in the script, then, then, then you have to realize that you're not, uh, you're not there. You're not, you're not, you're no longer a part of the, of the story. And that can happen. So you have to fix that. <coughs> in a studio, I'm aware that I'm there to work. I, I can finish a book in a studio in three, four days that I might spend two weeks on in my studio because the time pressure is different. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. So, you know, you know, it's like, you know, when you do it. Because you think of that tuna melt and you say, oh, I'm going to go. Yeah. Back. Yeah. Well, yeah, actually, I think of it. I say, let's take a break and get a tuna melt. Yeah. <laughs> and then, I, and, and then the, the, the advantage of being there is too, they, they pay for my lunch. So that's better. I always found that one of the uh, most interesting things back in the day when you were working in a studio and it was lunchtime, they fed you. The yes, they did. all had lunches. And I, I, I always thought it was funny. Well, if you're at home and you don't have any money, nobody's feeding you. But if <laughs> you're out here <laughs> making That's 15 right. plus 10 uh, doing promos, uh, you know, hey, would you like would you like lunch? Yeah. I hope well, it's I mean, good I mean, enough. I mean, yeah, the first time I did it, they said, what would you like for lunch? I said, what? I get lunch? I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I, I have some people, I think, who have some uh, questions they'd like to ask. Let me see. Uh, yeah, Grace Newton. Johnny, what are the four best tips for breath control? I practiced in breathing from my diaphragm, but sometimes I still have trouble. By breath control, I assume you mean not doing that all the time. And so here's here's a here are some tips for breath control. One thing, stop worrying about it. That's one. You know, unless you're a wheezing asthmatic, it's generally not noted. If you go and then the people people will pick up on that quickly. But if you just here's what you do. If if you're my suggestion to get over it is to do some uh, Shakespeare training. Literally, do some scene study and work Shakespeare. No one has breath groups as clearly defined as Shakespeare. And a shake, if you can do Shakespeare breath groups in an iambic pentameter and get the thing out, you'll 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 find you can do it anywhere. For audiobook performances, you need to look. If you have a problem keeping a breath throughout the entire breath group, you can find places on punctuation marks, colons, semicolons, commas conjunctions and those kind of things and beginning of prepositional phrases. You can take a beat and get a breath and it sounds absolutely natural. So those are places and you can see it in the sentence where you see punctuation. If it's, if it's Dickinsonian and it runs on where you see a punctuation mark, circle it, make a note. You can take a breath, but your breath needs to be understand. I just took a breath. You probably didn't hear it, but if it can't be ah, because then it's clear you're doing that. You just can't do that. But you can take a breath on on those places, and you'll find it much simpler. Don't worry as much about it as you are, though. Yeah, I was going to say, um, my thought uh, is, one, do you think about breathing when you're just talking to people? No, you don't. You take a breath when you need to take a breath. And it's very natural. And I think our job in voiceover is translating the written word into the spoken word. And the places you find your breath should be very natural. You almost shouldn't have to think about it. You shouldn't have to think about it. Yeah. Really? Uh, and, and if you are truly being conversational, I don't think you will much. And, and, and a quick side note, a lot of, uh, I find a lot of newer narrators, and some have been around a while, when they do their editing stuff, they take their breaths out. Oh. And I think, you know, don't, don't do that. No, I, I, you're a human being. There's an expectation that to continue to tell me the story, you need to be alive. So it's okay to breathe. You know, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I've already suspended my belief enough to believe you're these 17 people populating the story. 
I'm certainly going to let you breathe. <laughs> if I... Got another one for you here. Uh, Terry Briscoe asks, that not only happened to me with Alan Pinkerton in my first book. I, I, this was something else we talked about. Uh, it was a rush job and I had no idea he was the real person. And then I found <laughs> out know Alan. he was a historical figure and was Scottish. That was yes, what we he were was. talking yes, about. Yes. Read the book first so you know everything about yeah. the characters yeah. and the accents and whatnot. And I have to say on one of the three audiobooks that I did, I did run into something like that where the one of the characters yeah. was Russian and I didn't know That's until it. I got to yeah. the place where he was and I had been doing him yeah. like this. So uh, it's 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 you have to you have to um here's a little hint. What I do in a fiction book, even if it's, if it's historical, I only um gently, subtly suggest the accent. If it's worth putting in, if it's important, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to do Shrek for Alan Pinkerton, you know, but if it's a fiction book, I write down all the characters. I list them. I don't, I mean, that's how I start. I don't do it anymore, but I list them all and I cast them from my frame of reference. Basically, in other words, I think, you know, who could play this as Dave Fenoy. Now, let's say I say that I don't need to do Dave Fenoy impersonation, but if I think of casting Dave Fenoy, it's going to change how I play the character. If I think it's Alan Rickman, it's going to change. If I think it's my um, father, uh, Loftus, from my philosophy in college, you know, it, whoever, my uh, or Uncle Bill, or whoever it is, anybody who you think play the role, go ahead and cast them from your frame of reference. Could be the barista at Starbucks, anybody who you think should be that person. And it will help you play the role without just playing some unaffected, disassociated voice. Okay, got another question here. Um, Trenton Bennett, how do you handle it if you're given a book uh, to do that you don't love to read? Trenton, you bastard. Um, <laughs> I, I, here's, here's, let me answer, though, I was Anthony Robbins. How would you do it if you did? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Your head has to be much bigger for that. It's a, uh, how would you do it? If you did know, Ooh. or if you did love it, that's it. That's right. In other words, you can't, the listener can never know that you think this is crap. You know, if you say, oh my God, that's, if you think that even, it's going to come out in your read. There's a lot, I've done well, over you, a thousand. How do, you, how do you keep from not thinking it? You can you think, can. you just can't play it. Yeah, there you're, you go. You're an, you're an actor, you're in the moment. Be in the moment. Listen, the characters in a story don't know their characters in a story. This is their reality. If it's a shitty reality, so be it. If they can't speak in complete sentences without subject-verb agreement, that's how they speak. You know, when David Mamet was famous as a playwright, wrote all those stories, people said he really has his ear on the Chicago style of speech. I grew up in Chicago and not a single son of a bitch I ever met spoke like that. <laughs> Nobody. So, so, but the reality of the David Mamet world is to play it as though that is how people speak. That is the syntax they use. If you don't like the book, two things. One, you can turn it down before you record it unless you've signed a contract. You don't have to do it. If there are things that are reprehensible for you on religious, sociological, physical, any kind of levels, you know, if you've got issues, don't do it. If you just don't like the book, I'm sorry. You know, I've done, I've done, I don't know if I didn't like him, but I've done a lot of books. I did all, you know, I did all the Dr. Oz's early books <laughs> before he ran. Oh boy. And I, I, I was not a fan, Thought it was a, you know, but, and, but you can't tell if you listen to those books, I defy you to tell me I didn't like or I was not involved, or I didn't play. It's just because that's what you're getting paid. That's an actor. Now put it like this. If if you are, if David Fenoy gets hired to be Hitler in, in, my, in my new play, <laughs> Hitler was a great painter. So there's David Fenoy as Hitler. He does a fantastic job. Does that make David Fenoy a Hitler lover? No, makes him an actor. I, I just think if you don't love the book, the listener should never know you don't love it. If you can't do it for reasons of your own, then don't do it. You know, um, interestingly, uh, that 
comes over into just about everything else in voiceover. I'm thinking most specifically, though, about commercials, where uh, our job is to sell products that perhaps we don't use, products perhaps that we don't even like. I don't eat right. McDonald's, but I've made a lot of money doing com- uh, McDonald's commercials. Uh, yeah. So you, but I do find that you often have to have the conversation with yourself uh, as an actor. Recognize that you know, admit it. Yes, I don't like this book, but this is what I do. I don't like that product, but this is what I do. I, I'm going to let go of that. Maybe I have to do a substitution or something. Uh, but do what you have to do uh, so that no one hears that you find it distasteful. Yeah, and, and no one wants to know. I'm, when I had a when I was early, in my I started in commercials, you know, commercial voiceover and yeah. on camera. But I my first, when I first gigged, I was I was a poor actor. I mean, I, I made Campbell's chicken noodle soup last for days, <laughs> and um it, it, and I just, just I mean the things that the horrible things you went through that people think are romantic bohemian stories there. It's awful to be hungry is awful. Just awful. I got a gig. I auditioned for McDonald's and remember Peter Max, the artist. Yeah. Yeah. Did a lot of sports stuff. So the deal was if you bought a big Mac, which I did, I didn't like those too much. I still don't like them. If you bought a big Mac for $1, you got a Peter Max plate, you know, a, a, a nice China plate. And I was like, are you kidding? A dollar? I was very excited. Of course they hired me. Because I thought, I didn't like Big Mac, but the plate was fucking, was awesome for a dollar. <laughs> so they pick up on that. They pick up on that. Um, yes. So that's, so from then on, I think, if I don't like what I'm doing, how would I feel if it was a one dollar Peter Max plate? Oh, okay. And that, and that, and that's, so that's what the shortcut. afternoon. shortcut. Yeah, you need, all actors have shortcuts. They just don't yeah. always think of it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right, another question here. Uh, Terry Briscoe always has lots of wonderful questions. <laughs> What's the most difficult thing that you have to teach new audiobook students that came from other genres? Slow the fuck down. <laughs> you know, it, that was so perfect. <laughs> I covered it up because I thought, do we want to see this? I said, well, that's what, what I say it all the time to my students. And one of them in Zora Johnson embroidered it for me. <laughs> oh, so she, I which yeah. took some time. She had to slow the fuck yeah. down to do that. Yeah, she did. No. Yeah. One of the, in audio books, I remember until you get paid by the finished hour, there, there's no hurry. Take your time. Also in the, the art of audiobook acting is to, see the scene the author creates and to share that scene. I'm convinced that listeners of audiobooks, fiction or nonfiction, for them, it's a movie in their head. And that's what happens. And we have to let them do that. And here's Dave and I talking. And when we talked, I'm going to say, how do I phrase this? And see that beat I took, that pause? Those pauses are allowable. That's natural. And a lot of actors coming to audiobooks don't understand that not every bit of, of your empty wave file needs to be filled with squiggly lines. Some of those lines can be like that. It's okay because that's how people actually talk. You know, I, I liken that uh, to when you're watching a movie and they're having a conversation and somebody stops to think, or they're taking a bite of food uh, or they can't find their words Whatever it is, I, I go through this, uh, especially when I'm teaching voice acting for video games, people want to just say the words and not leave any spaces. Uh, yeah. and sometimes I blame it on, okay, you came out of commercials and you're used to doing 40 seconds worth of, of words in 30 seconds. And then, then. Uh, but that's not this. This has room. People take their time. Play the whole scene, not just wor- the words. What does it look like? What are you wearing? How are you moving? Uh, what's going on over there that you're seeing? You're We're reacting. You know, people say, say acting is reacting. And I think sometimes they think it's that one thing you're reacting to when you first started talking. But as any guy uh, in a relationship knows, um, you're talking to your gal and you see a reaction from what she says, and now you got to regroup and come up with another way yeah. of explaining that, that she understands that you're not 
insulting her or her family or this or that. Um, yeah. You take your time. Take your yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what you're, what you're saying is, ba is basic acting. I, I believe, here's the deal. Audiobook performance is very much like theatrical performance. And that's what it looks like because there's a script and you play all the characters. But there's a difference. There's no proscenium arch. You're never singing out Louise. You're never singing out to Row Double L. You don't have to do that. And like in theater, there's a backstory to every character. You know, when you're on stage, you're Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman. Your life doesn't begin with your first line in the play. For the actor began long before you showed up. Now, you can't do a backstory for every character in a 70-character book. But everybody did come from somewhere. They have a backstory. And I think if people would start looking at audiobook narration more cinematically, because that's how it is felt by the listener, it makes all the sense in the world. So that when I say, here's David and Johnny talking, and let's say the scene is, it, it, I think you need to think like a cinematographer. Is it sepia tint? Are there birds? Is it summer? Is it sunlight? Is it the light coming through the window with those little dust bunnies floating in the dust? That kind of thing. What's going on? What's the room look like? Answer those questions. Put yourself in that world and then begin. Yeah. What, what, what are the, what's the mood of the people? Did they just get up and they're kind of slow, haven't had their coffee yet? Or are they trying to get out the door because they got to get to work? And now yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's never line, 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 line. Never, no. never. It's not how the world works. You got to see the whole scene. Uh, I'm just going to read this one to you. Johnny, did you okay. have uh, any idea you'd be good at audio books when you started narrating them? Yes. Oh, you did? Yeah, of course I did. Oh, I, okay. I've never, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know the imposter syndrome they talk about? Uh huh. I, I, I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I was, I, you know, when I st I thought I was, I thought I'd be good at everything. Um, you know, I, <laughs> yeah, I still can't dunk a basketball, but most of the stuff I want to do, I can do. Um, yeah, did I think I'd be? I didn't. Here's what I didn't know. I didn't know it would be my, my niche. I didn't know there would be the, yeah. I didn't know I'd be the top of the smallest mogul in the entertainment industry. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, uh, you got a you got a lot of awards you got a th more than a thousand books you got almost as many awards uh oh i oh i want to correct something by the way i didn't know you know the grammy thing and the grammy uh -huh. nominee i found i'm not i found out i'm not and i didn't realize that till i looked it up today apparently it was it was for uh, uh um uh, what's a spider but spider uh, 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 charlotte's web so it got nominated for a grammy because meryl streep was the big the big heavyweight yes, carrying Barry. it to the yeah and she and she uh she didn't sell it all the way. We didn't win a Grammy. I blame Meryl Streep. But there was a there were a lot of people in the cast, and I was one of them. But apparently, even if it had won a Grammy, I think only the top three or so people actually were Grammy winners, and the rest of us are just um, people. <laughs> so, 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 so apparently you were, you were on I, the project, I, I, but yeah, yeah. So you're, I, I need to really cross that off my, in the Grammy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not even. Yeah. So I'm. I'm a nothing. I'm not a Grammy anything. So I have to re I have to remove that. But the other awards, I damn well earned. There, there I didn't go. really well, earn them. So somebody you, gave somebody, you got a lot somebody of gave them. them. Somebody gave them to me. Yeah. Yeah. That, so so with all the awards, I, what was one of them? There you you've uh, you've been nominated sixteen times. Won four for uh, Audis. Audis. You've yeah. got uh, Solvus Awards, like fifty earphone awards, something like that. I uh, there's a there's a they're here. Here's a they're they're here they're little certificates oh. i don't know where to put them well you you get a a bunch of uh frames frames and, you know, and then and then and, and they then what wall after wall after wall after wall <laughs> welcome they're... to my house featuring me <laughs> <laughs> well, i can't and... i i think if i walked in someone's house and saw all their crap up i'll just leave well, you know, well, you, you, you put my uh, put my I, high school my high school sports shit up there. I'm not doing. I, that. I, I think of some films I've watched where uh, they're portraying uh, stars who have these mm. huge portraits of themselves yeah. and many of them and yeah. statues and whatnot. And, and I, I've got a few yeah. awards up and yeah, that's right. Well, but uh, so I hope I, I have I some. 
I have some softball awards that mean, frankly, a little more to me, and I don't have those up either. Ah, what, um, what's your position playing softball? I, I played. Uh, I was. I was good in the outfield. Okay, yeah. that was an outfield. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah left I, field or yeah, right I, field? Left. Oh. And then I got older. Then I moved to right. <laughs> okay. <I was> gonna, <laughs> yeah. If you can play left field, you got to go. Yeah, yeah. So no, I was. I was good. Um. They say about your teaching that it is game changing. What are some of the things that you share with your students uh, that will help them become great audiobook narrators? Well, I can never promise or even offer greatness, but I, th I think in our in our world, insight. Well, it's, I, I think we need to be. I think one of the things we need to understand is what we want is not an envelope full of awards or a shelf full of awards. I believe in this business, working continually is is the reward. That's that's and that's that shows that when you get hired more than once by the same people, uh, that's that shows that you're doing it right. I think part of what I can do as a coach, first I'm I'm funny, so it's a reasonably well spent hour, so we have a good time. But I think I'm very quick, very quick to find what's going on to find the performance issues that we need to work on. And I'm generally fairly good um, at finding the way to communicate what you need to hear and the way you need to hear it to make a difference in your performance. What are, what are some of the performance issues that you run into a lot? Well, besides there's speaking too fast, you know, you know there, I don't know how to describe this, but you know how it is when, when remember John Lovitz did, I'm an actor, you know, that kind of thing. When, I, when I'm with a student, I chat a little bit about their background, where they are, get to know who they are. And then all of a sudden, chapter one, and all of a sudden, this, whole new, this brand new person enters to perform for me. I'm like, who is that? Who is that? Yes. And it's, yeah, so, so, I, I, so that's part of, that's a huge problem. Going too fast. Um, Being too playing, uh, uh, presentational. Yeah, it's way too presentational. And also playing voices instead of characters. Just taking and just in your you mind, key, yeah. how would you explain the difference between uh, playing voices and playing characters? I well, what I said in terms of casting from your own frame of reference, I said if you can cast anybody in this role, who would you cast? Why? Discuss it a little bit. Let's see what's going on here. Let's see who it is. So, why did you give this quirky, bizarre voice? And who do you know sounds like that? Also, why would you do a voice like that that hurts your instrument? If you're going to be a pirate. I almost everybody plays a pirate does a, a does ah and, and they're gonna that's you can't do a whole book and I've I've made some mistakes I've made choices that have hurt the instrument and made some mistakes but I I think it's important that you understand that again these aren't cartoon voice even the cartoon voices you like aren't just voices the voice actor the actor found the soul of that character and the voice worked. And, and a lot of times you display a voice, you know you've made, it's an act, acting is making choices. And if your choice is a voice that doesn't, it doesn't fit, but you're good at it, that's not, that's not playing the character. That's showing off your, your little voices. Play, who's the character? What is, what's happening? Who are they? Are they, whatever, find out what they're thinking, what they want, what's happening in the scene, and play that. <coughs> Excuse me. It's, it's, it's important that they understand whether it's a children's book, nonfiction, fiction, no matter what it is, you've got to share the author's truth. Okay. You have to be an engaging, compelling storyteller. You've got some uh, workshops coming up. I do indeed. Um, I just had a lovely meeting with my friend Scott Brick ah. in LA, in LA on uh, March 3rd, which is a Sunday. That night is the APA social that day. Scott and I, uh, and Gina will be having a uh, our sixth annual Business of Audiobooks workshop. It's probably going to be an exclusive club called the Aster, which is going to be right next to where the uh, social is. Um, we're going to have two tiers, um, and you get swag bags at both of them. The expensive tier, the more expensive tier, gets you front row seats, gets you uh, like $200 worth of bennies. So that's kind of cool, including sessions with Scott and with me, and it gets you tickets to the social. So that's Sunday, March 3rd. <coughs> Pardon me. Go to scottbrick.com. Excuse me. I got a little uh, 
feels like I'm growing a hair. In, unless I'm, I guess I have a cat. Anyway, so um, Godbreak.com. Godbreak.com, and you'll be able. To, you can't sign up yet, but the details are are some are there. The rest will be there, and then the one after that is going to be in May. I'm still working out the details in New Orleans. It's going to be kind of a workcation. So it's going to be um, right after the Jazz Fest. So if you go to the Jazz Fest, stay another few days with us. There's, we're going to get pretty good rates. There's five hotels I'm waiting for proposals back. The agenda will take us from the morning into the early afternoon. And then the three or four evenings will be together. We'll be either like tours or graveyards and stuff, or just going out, listening to music and eating great food. So you can bring your spouse, your significant other, um, and make it a vacation as well as work. So I want to combine those two. So it's not going to be full schedule. It has some free time. And I Dave, want, Dave wants to come. Coming soon. Um, how they, how can they find out how they, johnnyheller.com? Okay. Johnnyheller.com. That's a cleverly named, cleverly named website I made up there. Johnnyheller.com. Follow me on Facebook. Also, uh, Johnny Heller. On Twitter, I think I'm Johnny Heller VO Coach. I had another Twitter account, but... I was getting way too political, so I finally left because there a bunch of fascist Nazis there, and I couldn't take it. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> I'm, I'm so liberal. <laughs> I know. I know. So, and, then, and Instagram, I'm also cleverly uh, Johnny Heller. I try to keep the same name throughout. Um, but I, I here's the deal: I'm easy to find, and you can, if you have any questions, you can just email me. It's just if you can't find out how to find me, then you should don't be a detective. You know, it's funny. I've often, I'm often surprised by some of the questions that people will ask me. Not here. This group are fine. Uh, but I'll get questions and email uh, that just just go online. Type a sentence. Yes, search. It's, it's there. Spend a minute. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, um, it's but the, here's the deal. A lot of people... Again, they want to be, they don't want to take the journey. They just want the end of the journey, a pot of gold at the end. I want Dave, I don't want to be Dave Fanoy's work guy. I want to be Dave Fanoy. I want the riches and the, I want, I want J. Michael Collins' money. I don't want, I don't want to work for it. And that's part of the problem. This, this is acting. This is, this is not, if everybody could do it, everybody would do it. And one of the problems with these home studios is people have credit cards. They can buy all this crap. It doesn't mean they can act. It really doesn't. And I just I, think you need to understand that. I was telling the story the other day. I met a guy a number of years ago. He had just retired from whatever it was he was doing and decided to do voiceover. He bought a whisper room. He bought a, 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 a Neumann uh, U87. He bought, I think it was an Avalon 737 interface, a whole new computer system. He spent about $25,000 setting himself up with the perfect studio. Uh, a year or so later, I was at another uh, VO Atlanta, and he was there not as a participant, but trying to find some people who wanted to buy the stuff that he had bought because it just didn't work for him. Because, yeah, because he put the cart before the... If he had invested that 25000 in in making crystal meth, <laughs> there, that, see, that would have been that would have been the thing. Yeah. The, but the, the idea that this is just buy the equipment and I can... And people say to... To, to say that anybody can do what you do, is, it's really a wee bit off-putting. Yeah. Because um, they can't. I, I can't... Dave Fanoy's is special, and I think Johnny Heller is special. But what not, we do, not I just, yellow I, bus I, special, not yellow bus. No. Special. <laughs> <laughs> well, in your case, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, you're right. Yeah, sure, Dave. No, <laughs> well, speaking of special, thank you for the kind words. But you, my friend, are quite special. The industry uh, loves you. You're a great guy. I, I'm really disappointed you're not going to be at, at VO Atlanta this year because me too. I blame we have, Scott. We Rick. have a great time when we get together. Yeah, um, uh, I I can see why you did a little uh, stand up comedy, <laughs> and uh, just uh, I I'm sure uh, your students just love working with you. And uh, once again, I'm gonna remind everybody 
Uh, you're going to be doing a thing with Scott Brick March 3rd, a workshop. And right. Go to stop, scottbrick.com. Uh, Correct. And there will be information coming for the event you're going to be doing in New Orleans. In, yes, in yes. May. And plus my New England narrator a retreat in October. It's all at johnnyheller.com. Oh, when the leaves are turning and it's so lovely. Oh, it's, it's really, it's, we've been, that's like our 10th time there. It's great. Fantastic. We have like 70, 70 actors get together. It's a wonder. It's like up with people, except we have booze. You know, it almost yeah. makes me wish I did audiobooks. It makes me wish you did <laughs> audiobooks too. Yeah. You know, from <laughs> listening to them, it's funny. When I listen to them, I like, gosh, I'd really like to do that. And I, I don't think I'm bad at them. I just I'm sure you're not. It's, I just don't well, yeah, have you, the, the uh, it, you, temperament. You make more money with shorter I do. time doing what you do. Yeah. I do. Um, I mean, there, there's, it's not. It's not for everybody. It's it's a labor of love, but it, it does. I'll tell you what. It's not. It's not like chicken scratch money either. I mean, it pays all. I live in Manhattan. Yeah. Look, look, look at the opulent style. Look, look at the way I'm dressed. For God's sake, yeah. look at the money goes our, in this t-shirt. Uh, our, our buddy Scott Brick. <laughs> well, I was talking to him about it. He says, "Well, if you like being in a closet for eight hours a day." Then it might be for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 better than a quick roll in a snuff film. That's what I like to yeah, say. There you go. Better, <laughs> better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. Anyway, That's right. Mr. Johnny Heller, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a pleasure. Um, uh, you're a master of what you do, and and a really nice guy. A lot of fun I'm okay. to around. All right. Thanks, well, um, I'm looking forward to whenever I see you in person. Uh, and until then, uh, you know, keep doing your audio books and doing your thing. And thank you, my you, brother. Thanks so much. A pleasure. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Johnny Heller. Uh, and it, once again, if you're into audio books, this is somebody you just need to work with. All right. Uh, that wraps up another Ask Dave Fenoy Anything 702. We're two minutes over. Oh, no. This and all the other Ask Dave Fenoy Anythings live on my YouTube channel, Dave Fenoy VoiceOver Training. If you're interested in coaching with me, DaveFenoy.com, click on the Study VO tab. And now uh, there are bonus points. And you can follow me on Twitter, X, at Dave Fenoy VO. So until the next time, book something.